Okay, again, good morning. Today is the first day of Elul, the new month, which is the last month of the year. And it's the month of preparation for the new year for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Today we begin by blowing the shofar. And um, the reason we blow the shofar today and every day of the month of Elul is, to, is, like, a, is like a wake up call to, to kind of remind us and to inspire us to prepare. How do we prepare for the new year? Um, as we know, Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. Hashem judges the world. Hashem judges each of, each of us. And uh, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. Hashem forgives us. So these are 40 days. These are, four, these are 40 days of very powerful um, introspection, connection, um, really the highlight of the year. In, 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 in the memoirs of the previous Rebbe, he would describe when he was a young child and a, and a yeshiva boy, the atmosphere, once the, start, once the Elul began in the shtetl in Lubavitch and the other shtetl, when the Kimbo Shchodesh Elul and the blue the shofar, the whole atmosphere, there was the ear. He, said, he, he says the ear of, uh, of felt differently. It was called, it was, he called it the Elul wind. You know, the, 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 you, can, you can breathe it. Um, and the beauty that exemplifies, that brings out the power of Elul is, is actually by the famous analogy that the Alter Rebbe of Tanya writes, not in Tanya, but in another one of his other works, the analogy, a very powerful analogy of a king that, um, that, that uh, all year round sits in his castle and people have no access to the king. And once a year, the king um, goes on a, on a trip, he travels because he wants to meet the people. And then he, when he travels the land, he, not only do people have access to see him, but he wants to interact with them. He's enjoying their company. Um, so similar every year on, on the beginning of Elul, it says Hashem is in the field, which the expression in the field means he's accessible. When we say accessible, what does it mean that he's accessible? So we find in the writings of, um, of um, in the prophets and in Jewish law that the word Elul, which is the month that we are starting today, has the acronym for letters of Ani Lododi Vidodi Li which is a famous verse from Song of Songs, which is uh, which many people know the verse because it's used. My beloved and beloved is me. That's right, which is, I am my, I am my beloved and my, my beloved is me, mine. Ani ledodi vidodi li, which a lot of people use in, in, by marriage as, a, as a, a, how King Solomon describes the love um, of, a, of a husband wife to the love of Hashem with the Jewish people. So the word Elul is, Aleph is Ani, which is I, Le, the Lamed is Le Dodi, to my beloved, Ve Dodi, and my beloved is Li, is to me, so that is the whole idea of El. Now, if you go a little bit more mystical and Kabbalistic, it says that in the months of Elo, the 30 days, there is the, 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 the 13 attributes of mercy. What are the 13 attributes of mercy? What is that? So we know, and it's actually interesting because um, mo most people don't know this detail, that when Moshe went up to the mountain the second time after the golden calf, for the final time to ask Hashem for mercy, what day did he ascend to the mountain? And how long was he on the mountain? Let's, let's, go, let's do it this way. How long was he on the mountain? He was, on, he was on the mountain for 40 days. Yeah. What was the day that Hashem forgave the Jewish people of the golden calf where forgiveness was introduced to the world? Yom Kippur. So, so 40 days prior is the first day of Elul. This is today. Today marks the day that Moshe sent to the mountain. And it says when he sent the mountain, the people in the camp blew the shofar to inspire people to repentance to tshuva. One of the ways how Moshe was able to invoke the mercy of Hashem is by uttering the 13 attributes of mercy. It was a prayer we say on Yom Kippur many times. Hashem, Hashem, Hashem is all merciful. 
the 13 different ways of Hashem's mercy. And those 13 attributes is, is, actually a, is actually an expression of Hashem's mercy that on the time of Elul, starting from today, is, 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 is highlighted and, and in a sense accessible more than any time of the year, even more than on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And this is very interesting and very powerful. But the Alter Rebbe writes that, that what happens when the king comes back from his trip, when he comes back, when he's in traveling in the, in the field, traveling in the field on the campaign trail, right? The farmers come out. He stops his wagon. He asks with the farmers, but any simple person can come and talk to the king. But then he returns to, turns to the capital. Once he enters into the city, the, the barricade the streets. People can no longer come closer to the to the entourage. Only very special people. And then when he enters the um, the castle, then only the the ministers and VIP have access to him. It's very difficult to go to to the king. Says the Alter Rebbe, on the month of Elul, the king is in the field, meaning that we have such easy access to Hashem like no other time. Comes Rosh Hashanah, Hashem is back in his in his castle, so to speak. It's no, it's not easy anymore just to go to Hashem. You gotta, you gotta work a lot harder, and you keep her even more harder. Yes, because that's a serious day. That's when mm -hmm. Hashem is sitting on His throne and He judges and He and He and, is, and He signs the the, your, the book of life. So the best and the most important days are the days of Elul that we're in now, and utilize the time. So when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, you don't wake up. Um, you know, oh, now we're gonna go to the king. So, but how do we do that? How do we get? How do we actually get close to Hashem? How do we? How do we do that best? So the chauffeur reminds us. We blow the chauffeur every day, starting from today. And maybe, maybe I can get a chauffeur out and uh, blow the chauffeur here on Zoom. Although it's not, not it's not. It doesn't fulfill the obligations. There's another beautiful, and I want to encourage you to do this because it's very. Um, it's very um, easy for everybody to do so, and there's some very spiritual powers to it. And this goes back, and I quote from the, um, the Alter Rebbe, I think from the quotes from his teacher, to his teacher, the Baal Shem Tov, that he received this special instruction that from today until Yom Kippur, we should recite every day three chapters of the Tehillim, three chapters of Psalms. And uh, so we can cover the entire book of Psalms in these 40 days. So today you would start reading chapter one, two, and three. Tomorrow you continue to four, five, and six. If you miss a day, you just, you just catch up. You go back and, and catch up what you have done. On your, so when you do that for 40 days, you get to somewhere 100, chapter 130, some 32 or something, or less. Uh, well, no, 120 actually. Yeah. 10, 10 times, uh, 40, 40 times 3 is 120. So how do you, there's 150 chapters. On your Kippur itself, you add, not, and it's, it's, I, there's a chart. You add nine chapters before Kol Nidre, nine chapters after Kol Nidre, then nine chapters after the prayers of Musaf and Yisker, and then another nine chapters after Neila, and that's how you conclude the whole Tehillim. So it's a beautiful, easy way. It doesn't take long to read three chapters. If you read it in Hebrew or in English, five minutes. So do that. That's one, that's one powerful way to do. Another thing I would I would uh, encourage you to do is uh, Rabbi Simon Jacobson has a fantastic book. If you don't have it, I highly recommend to get it. Um, and it has meditations for every day of Elul until after Sukkot and Um, It's something called 60 days. I will, God willing, post it on, on, the, uh, on the chat so you can order it probably on Amazon or you can even, even there might be a link and you can read it on, on the internet. But those two things I think is uh, in, in addition to your mitzvahs and tzedakah and, and prayers, that goes without saying. That is the introduction to the month of Elul now let's go and jump into Tanya. Uh, maybe that was a good... Uh, um, Can I ask you a quick question? Yep. And the 13 principles of mercy. How do we know about it from Rambam? Or where, how do we know about it? Oh, um, that is, that's, that's accessible. 
that, in, that is accessible in El, how do we know what are the 13 attributes of mercy? What's your question? Where is the source of it? That that is accessible in Elul? No, no, no. The Torton principle. It's in the Torah. It's in the Torah. Okay. I'll tell you where. Um, there are a few places. The, our, the original place is in the book of Exodus. Okay. I don't it's know the precise way. I'm just wondering. Okay. It's good, to, it's, good, it's good to look it up anyways. And also it's interesting that whenever Moshe was in trouble with the Jews, he invoked the 13 attributes of mercy. Right. Like right. after the story of the spies, you'll see that there as well. But right after the, the, the golden calf and where has, where he, the whole discussion and second tablets, um, how Hashem forgave the Jewish people, um, you'll find it in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Okay. Thank you. So now I understand why 13 is a lucky number for Jews. <laughs> <laughs> there are many numbers lucky for all numbers. Um, um, uh, there, Rita, we talked about the number 13. You know why it's a lucky number? Yes. The Hebrew word of Echad, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Echad is one, Hashem is oneness, which is the which is the definition of, of everything of Hashem and everything we do, that is everything is one. The word echad spelled aleph, which is one, chet is eight, and dalet is four. Totals? Very good. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi. It's all interconnected. Thank you. Okay. So let's get into Tanya chapter 39. Hey, you want to say hi? Wow. <laughs> She's growing. So. Hello, beautiful. Hi. You can take a nap. Yeah. I just want to watch this. You want, you want to give the class? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if you remember, we uh, we were kind of, uh, I felt last week we went into a very deep mystical cave and it got darker and darker because the light, the light was getting more intense. <laughs> and um, it, was, uh, it was quite a journey. So we left off that you are going to continue reading until I believe section five. No, section four. Section four was for our homework. Oh, I see. You said to read it on our own, and then you were going to pick it up at section five. Yeah. Correct. Okay, so we're picking up at section five when Kavana is lacking, right? Page 464. Yeah. Perfect. So in, 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 in the, if I would put it in a nutshell, what he said in the past was basically that Kavana having proper intention and meditation while doing a mitzvah or study Torah is considered the soul of the mitzvah, the soul of the Torah. Without that, it's just a body. Yes, you fulfill the mitzvah, but it's like a body without soul. Plus, not only is it just a soul into the mitzvah, but it elevates us higher than the levels of angels, where angels don't have the ability to reach higher um, spiritual realms, like the world of Atsilos, the world of Bria and Yitzira, because they're kind of stationed and stuck in one location. For humans, we have the ability to elevate um, and our, our, our performance of Mitzvah and Torah with Kavana, um, depending on the intensity, the intensity of the of the kavana, helps us helps us reach us to levels that angels don't even have the ability to do so. Although he says that those levels are really reserved for tzaddikim, um, a tzaddik has the ability to really go into higher levels. You know, I, I, I mentioned this story probably in the past. It's a powerful story that talks about the the part of that the mitzvah has to be done in the physical body. Because one of the mistakes that people do is they is that they find that the mitzvahs, which are so physical in nature, um, is a contradiction to to spirituality or holiness. When we talk about spirituality, and holiness, 
we, we, we think about it a kind of an out-of-body experience. We don't want to be involved with, with our physicality in when it comes to spiritual pursuit. So the more we can disengage, the more closer and higher can I can my soul ascend. Um, you know, that's how actually the, the two sons of Aaron, when they went into the holies of holies and they died, it says they died because they wanted to die. They wanted to expire. They felt they had what's called a close hanefesh, which means their soul, the soul kind of melted in the in the spiritual ecstasy. So yeah. I know. So the deal is when, but we know from from learning in Torah that if the this whole purpose of the soul is that the soul does comes down into a body and the, the body is the one that does the mitzvah with the soul. So the, the body gets elevated along with the soul, which is the whole purpose of creation. Why did God create a universe, a physical universe? Is if if, if he could have just left it with all the spiritual worlds and the angels and have a good time, be in the bliss, and, and enjoy the bliss of God. But Hashem wanted us to be in a physical body, in a physical world, to elevate the, the world. The Alter Rebbe, my point was that Alter Rebbe um, had a, a colleague uh, who were students of the Holy Magid. These were, you're talking about spiritual beings, super, super spiritual beings. And the colleague, I forgot the name, um, doesn't matter, um, was getting, they were meditating together and he was getting in a, uh, what's, a what's the English word, in a tranche where they completely, um, completely disengaged himself physically. A trance. A trance. A trance. And literally for three days, he was unconscious. Three days. When he came back, he he told the Alter Rebbe the, the the most powerful experience he had while being in the kind of outer body. Right. He, he was busy with with the most spiritual uh, realms of Bir Yitzhak here you can imagine. Right. However, for the rest of his life, he was lamenting and repenting that he missed three days of laying to fill him. Mm-hmm. You think about it. Laying tefillin, right? I mean, is this a physical act? Here, it's not like he was sleeping for three days. He was in, in, in the most spiritual, uh, intense uh, situation. But he, uh, he explained, as intense as it was, it doesn't even compare to the intensity and the nuclear um, explosion, so to speak, that happens when you have the body and the soul do a mitzvah together which we learned in the previous chapter, is really goes to the will of Hashem, which is the essence of Hashem, right? The, the, the a mitzvah is the will of Hashem. When you are engaged in spiritual pursuit and meditating and all that good stuff, it's, it's, it's in a sense, you're only reaching the wisdom or the, the, the light of Hashem, but you don't get to the essence, to the, you know, there's or, which is light, and there's ma'or, the source of the light. You don't get to the source, you get to the light, but not the source. The source is the essence of Hashem. How do we get to the essence of Hashem is a mitzvah. Why? Because that's the will. And when it comes to the will, we talked about we've learned that many times, it touches the it touches the core of Hashem. Just like by us, who we, we are creating Hashem's image, right? We're creating Hashem's parallel. The a will of a person touches the core of a person. Similar when we say the will of Hashem. When I fulfill a mitzvah, I, I, I get access to the essence and core of Hashem. That's why when we do a mitzvah, we say many times, he ratzon, may it be the will of Hashem. When, I may begin, when we do mishaberach, for example, we also, what's the idea of a mishaberach? We try to invoke the will of Hashem to bring the blessing that should come from the highest level, from the essence of Hashem. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you, Hashem elokeinu melech olam, we don't talk, we don't say only Elokeinu is Hashem who is our God, but Ata, Ata is you, the essence of Hashem. 4.54, when Kavana is lacking. So, so far we've discussed different levels of Kavana. Which propel your soul and your mitzvah, 
at the world, so you'd see Rabbi and Atsilas. Now we will turn to lower levels of attentiveness. Now, as we stated above, reward for mitzvah is a mitzvah. This is a, one of the most famous lines in all of Mishnah. It's an essence of our father, of Piki Avos, that the reward of the mitzvah is the mitzvah. What does that mean, the rewards of the mitzvah is the mitzvah? Right? It's like saying, um, if you are going to paint for me, what's your reward that you were able to paint for me? No, I, my word is I want, to, I want to get paid for a painting. So most, most scholars and most Torah observant Jews actually, they, you know, they subscribe to the idea that we do a mitzvah, we get a reward. Where do we get a reward? Either in this physical world or in, this, or in the world to come. Comes the mission says, no. The reward of the mitzvah is the fact that you did the mitzvah. That's, how does that explain? Meaning that from its reward, you can now, you can know the mitzvah's quality and level. In other words, the spiritual destination where your mitzvah ends up, we can discern the kavana you had when you performed it. So the, 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 the kavana that you have, so the kavana brings us to a certain destination. What's the reward of the mitzvah? The reward of mitzvah means here, as the way it explains it here, is the, way, the amount of kavana you have that will translate the amount your mitzvah will reach. So your mitzvah is actually creating the reward itself. And we should not concern ourselves with things esoteric. <laughs> That's a very famous line in Talmud. Namely, the great tzaddik on the level of chariot, which is unattainable for most of us. We should only discuss those things revealed to us. Things to which, which every person ought to aim. So you need to have a profound recognition of the following. So first, so he's giving a kind of an introduction which he should have given us a few chapters earlier, right? That these there are things that he calls in Hebrew um, nis, nistar or hester. Nistar is the esoteric, the hidden things. And the Talmud says, no asik in the stars. We shouldn't be concerned so much with the esoteric things. That's for special high, holy souls. We should be more occupy ourselves with the teaching of things that are more revealed. So in the, in the, now you can just imagine when the Alter Rebbe writes that for the Alter Rebbe, what is revealed to, to him is, is super hidden for us. And, but he's trying to explain a certain, certain things that might be very hidden to us so it becomes more revealed, which is the whole purpose of Tanya and teaching that the Alt Rebbe adopted from his teacher and from the Baal Shem Tov, that the Mashiach told, that when will Mashiach come? When you will, when you will share the wellsprings of, of Torah, of Hasidus, to the masses, when we explain it to the masses. So let's, let, let, let's, let's continue, about in 454. Sorry, 464. It looks like a 5, 464. But first, Tanya will summarize briefly what we have learned so far about Kavan, spiritual quality, level of your divine worship, if it's some palpable reverence and love in your heart, that results from cognition and recognition of the blessed infinite one's greatness. So then the spiritual address of such worship is in the tense of fears of Berea and worship motivated by the inherent reverence of love, which doesn't excite the heart, but remains as a, cons as a cons consent in the mind so it's, it's more in the mind, not so much passion in, in the heart. It's spiritual address, is a dense fears of Yitzira. We learned that there is Berea, highest level, Yitzira, and Asiya. So if you do with heart and mind, address your mitzvah gets to Berea. If it's just with the mind, less heart, it goes to Yitzira. Now we'll turn to the main topic of the section, the mitzvah, which is lacking in Kavana altogether. Again, this will have various levels. Worship that is not motivated by reverence and love, not even consciously as a consent in the mind. In other words, you didn't even awaken the love already dormant in your heart to bring it to light from its prior state of concealment hidden, hidden in your heart. You didn't even make it conscious as a consent in your mind or in your hidden place in the heart, as the very least. Rather, the love remains hidden in your heart as it was a birth and the same state as before you worship. But she says, we all have it in our heart, naturally, 
a love and reverence for Hashem. All you got to do is to activate it. But you didn't even do that. You just left it the way, by default, you were born this way. You didn't activate it. So in that case, your worship will remain below in the world of separateness, also known as the superficial dimension of the world. As such, worship has not been empowered by you to rise and to be absorbed in God's unity, even in the 10 holy spheres of Asiya, the lowest of the world. So what does it do? Does it even do anything? So he says, the sharp distinction between a world of fears which are divine and its superficial dimension, which is not, is explained by the Rabbi Shantalman in one of the discourses. In the superficial dimension of the world, since the time when they were created something from nothing, the blessing for light has never shown the dear, for they were created to be separate. If you learn without Kavana, the breath of your speech, and all the powers of your animal soul from Klippus Noga only escape the physical world of four elements, but they remain in the chambers and repositories of the superficial dimension, very far from the light of God's face, as, as, as far as can be, may God have mercy. As the Kuna Zor teaches, without reverence and love, will, uh, the mitzvah will not fly upwards, it, can, it cannot rise up and stand before God in, in any world. So just to quick um, uh, explain this idea here, this is uh, something that we are a little bit familiar with. When Hashem created the world, when Hashem created everything, he also created a klippa, right? What was the purpose of klippa? Hashem created a klippa to be as a channel to challenge um, holiness. Now, everything in the sense started from Hashem and then it has its journey. So when he says something from nothing, Hashem created ex nihilo, something from nothing. When we say this, Hashem created something, what does that mean, something? It means that it's, it's, that's, what, that's what he translated here in a sense. It became a superficial reality. Yeah. What's a superficial reality? A superficial reality is a reality that doesn't sense it's okay, but I'm learning. Yeah, you want it? Yeah. Okay. A superficial reality is something that doesn't sense the unity of Hashem. That's clipper. So the body, the he says the the, the when you do a mitzvah, who does the mitzvah? Your body, which is in a sense clipper, your animal soul. Your breath that you're learning Torah and praying, the breathing is also clipper. So the, vit the vitality that does the mitzvah comes from, from animal soul. However, if you have the kavana, then the animal soul, the clipper part, goes from the superficial reality into the reality of oneness of Hashem. So when you perform a mitzvah and you have no kavana, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Play with the baby. When you have when you did the mitzvah with no kavana, your mitzvah is done, but the mitzvah powers stays in the superficial reality in a sense. Mm -hmm. However, when you do kavana, then it goes into the, the world of unity of Hashem. Okay, that was that that was that, that that's that's the yeah, I would say that's probably the simple or profound way to say, to express the power of Kavana, as we've learned it here in the last few chapters. Kavana elevates our, our, our beings. When we do the mitzvah, the mitzvah doesn't remain in a superficial reality. It gets, it gets absorbed in the, in, the, in, the, in the universe of unity, universe. So this is, this is now, a mitzvah that I did without kavan, right? It stays kind of a superficial reality. So now he goes one level lower. What happens if I do a mitzvah with the wrong intention? I know people love talking about this. What if he did the mitzvah with an alternative motive or a selfish motive, right? You gave tzedakah, why? Because you wanted everyone to know that the Mr. Big, big, big Mensch, Big Macher did the mitzvah, right? You get your name on the big building. And you make sure every, you tell everybody. Mm -hmm. 
So is so where where does that mitzvah go? Because in this, I like what he mentions in the in, in a few lines earlier. He uses the word spiritual address. I love that. Think about mitzvah as a package, right? And there's an address. What is the address of every mitzvah? <laughs> it depends how much postage you put on. <laughs> More kavana, better address. Less kavana, not such a good address, right? Okay, but what happens if I did the mitzvah with not, not only no kavana, I did it for in a, in a selfish motivation or sometimes even inappropriate intentions. Let's see what he says. The Zor, the Kuan Zor did not state that the mitzvah was done with an appropriate or selfish intention. It was simply lacking the emotions of love and reverence of God. The Tana gives us practical illustration of such an intent. It means that even if your worship was not completely inauthentic, carried out for some ulterior motive, God forbid, other than worship God, well, there wasn't the spirit of the worst. Their reverence of me is mitzvahs of man performed by wrath, meaning worship was done out of habit. You've grown accustomed from, from, to from childhood that your father and teacher trained you and taught you to behave as one who reverence God and worships him. So before I, I jumped, I'm sorry, I jumped. I went from no intention to inappropriate intention. There's one, there's one stage in between that he says here, if you do something by rot, you just do it because you, you're used to it, right? Just like you wake up in the morning and put it under filling, not even thinking, you're just doing it without it. Where does where's the address of that? But on the other hand, the worship was not generally authentic Lishma either, because it's impossible for worship to be generally to generally generally, is that the right word? Authentic, unless there is a stirring of innate reverence and love. As the very least. To bring these emotions to light from their prior state of concealment in the heart, if not palpably in the heart, then at the very least in the brain and your hidden places in the heart. Because just as you wouldn't do something for your friend to fulfill his will unless you loved or, 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 or revered him, likewise, it's impossible to do something authentically for God to generally fulfill his will without recalling and stealing your love and reverence of him at all. At the very least, you're in your brain and your hidden places of your heart, and love alone without at least a basic level of reverence is not called real worship, and this low reverence is latent in the heart of all Israel, as I explained above below. So worship, which is devoid of any basic love of reverence, even no, even if no ulterior motive is present, cannot rise up and stand before God. So if it's done by God, it doesn't rise up, it stays kind of still done for Hashem, but stays in the superficial dimension. So let's now continue the next lower level, section, uh, section six. Um, when an interior motive is present. And if your observance is completely inauthentic, with some self-serving interior motive, such as studying Torah, not to worship God, but to become celebrated as a Torah scholar, Everybody should see here as a Torah scholar. Right? You want the you want the you want the honor. Then the ulterior motive, which is from Kalipas Noga, becomes enmeshed with your Torah. And the Torah becomes temporarily exiled in the Klippa. The failure to rise up and stand before God in section five is not the worst case scenario for your mitzvah. At that level, the mitzvah didn't go up to God, but it didn't go down either to Klippas to Klippas either. But if you have a self-serving motive, a temporary your mitzvah will be trapped by klippa. That doesn't mean that klippa has control over your mitzvah. It just means that the klippa hides the mitzvah energy notes on time. And that is until you do teshuvah, which brings healing to the world. Since when you return to God, the Torah returns with you from klippa. An interesting question here is, so, so, so this is very powerful words. So if you do the mitzvah unintentionally or with self, a selfish intention, it's, you know, which in a sense, the question is, should a person still do the mitzvah? It's always a big question. Should a person, I get this question many times, we ask the question ourselves. 
I'm only motivated to do the mitzvah for selfish purposes. So I still do the mitzvah, or, should, or I don't want to be. I don't want to do the mitzvah at all. So we know that the the, the Mishnah says we learned it earlier. Still do the mitzvah. We learned why still you still do the mitzvah. So he says because if you do the mitzvah without the proper intention, it will lead to the to do it with the right intention. It's like it's like um, fake it till you make it idea, right? Mm -hmm. Fake it till you make it. Okay. But of course, Hasidic teaching doesn't uh, doesn't end accept that idea of fake it till you make it on a superficial level. They're going to explain that a lot deeper. So the beauty the Rebbe many times said in Hebrew, it translates from. Metoch can mean from, from doing it without the proper intention, it will lead you to do it with the right intention. The Rebbe says the word metoch in Hebrew can also mean the inside. It means to say that even if you say that I don't have the proper intention doing this mitzvah, I'm doing it out of selfish motive, deep down, your soul, your neshama has the right intention. Mm -hmm. Here, the Alter Rebbe takes it a step further and says, if we're going to take it for the spiritual address, right? Where does the mitzvah go if it's done without intention? He says, it's trapped. It's a mitzvah that gets trapped by klippa because the energy of doing a mitzvah comes from klippa. Physical activities is klippa. So the energy to perform a mitzvah comes from klippa. If this kavana, it takes the klippa out of its shell and brings it into the world of, of Hashem. That's the purpose of kavana. If I don't, do the, if I don't have the right kavana, he says here, it will remain in Klippa. However, it won't remain there forever. And it doesn't take uh, it doesn't take the mitzvah and downgrades the mitzvah into Klippa. The mitzvah stays the mitzvah. It's still, it's still stuck in, in the idea of a Klippa universe. Ha, here is the power. That when you have still have the power to redeem that mitzvah by doing Teshuvah. So, so the answer is do the mitzvah anyways. Because why? Because hopefully one day or the mitzvah itself will inspire you to do tshuva. And if you do tshuva, now you can, you can harness all those mitzvahs that you've done in, your, in, in the past and bring them up to the level that you need to, which is so appropriate for the days we're in now for El. Okay? So let's, let's, let's continue here. He's asking, he's asking, he's going to ask an interesting question. Okay, we have 468 in the middle. It says an interesting question here. Is. An interesting question here is when you do tshuva for prior worship conducted with an ulterior motive, thereby freeing that worship from the clip in which it has become enmeshed. So what world does your prior worship now ascend? So where does it go? That's an that's a super question. I love the question. Because what did we say? Uh, Kavana is the is, is the postage to bring me to a spiritual level. So if it didn't have a kavana, it got stuck in Klippa. Now I do tshuva Hashem, I'm for, I ask you forgiveness. I really want to do the mitzvah with Kavana. Okay, so now we say the mitzvah gets back, gets back elevated. How does it get elevated? It's it's past the action. You're not doing that. You can you have kavana? Can I have kavana on the mitzvah that I did yesterday? I can't have kavana on something I did yesterday. In other words, if I gave you tzedakah, right, and I didn't have kavana, can I say no? Today I'm going to have kavana and meditate on on the money that I gave yesterday. It's it's too late. I can ask for forgiveness to Shuva. But how does a Kavana get applied right to Fatah? So he says, the answer is, it depends what motivated your Shuva. If your Shuva was motivated by intellectually generated love and reverence, the Torah will ascend to the world of Bria. But if the Shuva was motivated by innate love and reverence, I want to say, she's tired. <laughs> um, <laughs> But if the truth was motivated by innate love and reverence, the Torah will ascend to the world of Kitsira. Therefore, I say just a blessed memory. A person should always engage in Torah study. 
and performance of mitzvahs even inauthentically, for out of doing it inauthentically, it will come to do authentically. Okay, all right, so that person should always engage because like we're just, just what I quoted earlier, and this is the what I said, I'm doing without kavana, you will do it with proper kavana. If an inauthentic worshiper comes in meshed in clipper, why does the Talmud encourage it? Apparently, the Talmud based its it sta it sta it statements on the above point that when you return to God, your Torah returns with you from clipper. Talmud reasons that it's an absolute certainty that you will eventually do tshuva. Guys, listen to this line. Did you just say hear this line in Talmud? Talmud says, an absolute certainty that you will eventually do tshuva. A promise that all Jews will always do, will end up doing tshuva, repentance. Either like either in this incarnation or in another one, since, quoting from Samuel, a banished person will not remain banished from him. It's not that it, this is this is a promise by the prophet by Hashem. It's a, it's a very famous line that the Jew is never lost. You know, the philosophy of the Rebbe was always we reach out to every Jew, no matter what type of Jew. Why? Because we never give up on the Jew. The Neshama and every Jew, no matter what, wants to come back to Hashem and will come back to Hashem. And we hit to assist them. And it's also inspiring for ourselves. The idea that is that a person is never lost. The idea, the philosophy that that we never give up on ourselves, is such an empowering, it's an important, powerful idea that we need to we need to teach that. That's something that the world wants to hear. The world it resonates with people. It's not that the in, in authentic worship rises to God actually gets trapped in clipper. But inauthentic worship is still worthwhile in the long run because you will definitely redeem it at some point later on. If it's not in this lifetime, next lifetime. But remember, we are in the last generation of, of exile. We are the, uh, we're going to be the generation that will greet Mashiach. So that means that this generation is going to be the generation that's going to, going to all return to Hashem. And so... When we we now return to the lower level of inauthenticity, in inauthenticity mentioned above, where it's not kavana, but no alternative either, such as the observance by wrath. But if your worship is neutral, neither inauthentic nor authentic, then this criterion for your worship to be elevated to God is far easier, and it doesn't depend on teshuva. Rather, as soon as you go back and learn the Torah with an authentic intent, the thing that you learned with neutral intent will join with the current authentic study and it will fly upwards together. Tshuva is not necessary in, the, in this case because your neutral study hasn't yet become enmeshed with any Klippas Noga, so it doesn't require Tshuva to release it. And therefore, when speaking of the lower level of inauthenticity, the mere absent absence of kavana, we can now clearly say that a person should always engage in Torah study and performance of mitzvahs because in such a case, the damage is less. There's no enmeshment in clipper, no tshuva is required, just another Torah session later on with the correct intent. And the same is true of pray without concentration. You simply have to pray again with concentration and all your early prayers, the void of concentration, will be elevated to you. Powerful, beautiful. Not so difficult. So I, I would say that to many people, that's the kavana that they're lacking, right? That they're starting to do mitzvahs out of rot. So what he's saying is, all you have to do is to do one mitzvah or one Torah study with proper kavana, proper intention, and then it will have a rector actually, it will, it will, it will affect all the mitzvahs that by rock, that they get elevated to the high level. You don't even need to do tshuva. Tshuva takes a lot more energy, takes a lot more work.
as stated in the Zohar, the Zohar teaches, if a prayer is not worthy, listen to this, a chief angel pushes it out and it goes down and hovers about the world, standing at the lowest of the firmaments below, which conduct the world. And in charge of that firmament, there's a chief angel by the name of Sahadiel. He takes all the rejected prayers, called invalid prayers, and stores them until that person repents. And if he properly repents before his master and offers another good prayer, then when the good one rises, the chief angel Sahadiel takes the invalid prayer and lifts it up until he meets the good prayer. And then they both rise and intermingle together and go out before the holy king. I love that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Which, by the way, not so related, but gives a little inkling, the power of Kaddish. Power of saying Kaddish. When we pray for a soul, even past a lifetime, we help that soul that their mitzvahs or their prayers that maybe were, were lacking some intensity or kavana, and but the angel is waiting for it stored, it's not lost. We can do a mitzvah and help those mitzvahs to be elevated to a place where it should be. But that's so beautiful. So here we got we got a glimpse in the uh, celestial systems of uh, of uh, of the of the ministering angels, how they uh, store our prayers. Hmm. Let's see, is it is it stored digitally or 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 in the in a safe deposit box? Binary. Binary. <laughs> Any questions? Well, I suppose it's stored in the quantum field. Uh, I, that's just what I said. The quantum. Oh, you said that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It, it went from binary to quantum. <laughs> um, it's so cool, you know. I didn't hear it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not sure if this is correct, but perhaps when we welcome Shabbos, <laughs> welcome to Shabbos, we sing Shalom Aleichem. We welcome the angels. Shalom Aleichem means Shalom to you, Malachi Yasharis, the ministering angels. And we sing it. Then we say, Boyachem, come. And then we say, Tzeschem. We say goodbye to those angels. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a changing of the guards on Friday evening. They are the weekly angels, Shabbos angels. And are sitting by a Friday night table during the midst of Shabbos. They are, they are now carrying all of our weak loads of prayers and mitzvahs and bring it to Hashem. But perhaps, perhaps they, they are also here to redeem what we have missed out. Sometimes during the week, we are busy, mm -hmm. we're running around, right? We're not relaxed, we're not focusing so much on Kavana. And that's why Hashem gave us a Shabbos, so they rest. They rest Hashem, like we learned in this chapter, right? Where the whole world gets elevated to a higher state. And the Shema gets elevated to a higher state. Shabbos is the gift Hashem gave us that we can, where we can, we have the ability to redeem those mitzvahs that we did during the week that lacked the intensity. On my own, I, on my own, uh, maybe I, I say that without any, uh, <laughs> without any responsibility, but perhaps I can check that. All right, let me see if I can grab a show for a quick and I'll give you the uh, joy of listening to the show. Hold on a second. Oh, where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Hello. 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 Still, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Where? Where? Oh, where? close to Berlin. Oh. Even more, more, more um, to the west, Magdeburg. Oh, okay. Okay, so I was uh, I was looking for a horn, so I had to go catch a catch a ram in the bushes oh. here. Uh, good, good. Thank you. Did you, did you slider it properly? <laughs>
Chodesh as a special treat. Hello. <laughs> that was good. That was good, Rabbi. Tom, you want to say hi? Hi, hi. Oh, hello, Rabbi. You look wonderful. Everybody, it's nice to see you. I hear lots of I hear lots of noise. How's everybody? Good. How you feel? Baruch Hashem. Thank God. <laughs>